I'd like for us today to uh, do things just a tad different. I don't want to change anything that uh, the wonderful Pastor Allen does, but uh, would like to have a pastoral prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer at this time rather than later after the message. Shall we pray? Oh God, too often our prayers are one-sided and our prayers are for those people and things that haven't been fixed yet as since last we prayed. So today our prayer is not only for the usual things we pray for, but also for the opposite things. We pray today not only for the sick, but for the well, in fear that our pride will rule over their happy hearts. We pray not only for the poor, but also for the rich, who find it so hard to enter the kingdom of heaven. We pray not only for the troubled, but also for the favored ones, in fear that peace with the world gets confused with the peace of God. We pray not only for the dying, but also for the living, since they face eternity as well. And we pray not only for those who are burdened, but also for those who take life casually, so that indolence doesn't rot their soul. Lord, we pray not only for the elected politicians of our country, but also for the people, the people because it is they who pay the price for the abuse in government when it happens. We pray not only for missionaries or on foreign shores, but also for the rest of us who still don't know that in Christ there is no east or west, no north or south, but one great human family in the world that grows smaller and smaller by the years. We pray not only for ministers of the gospel, but also for people of the gospel, since all who believe are called to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray not only for fair weather, but also for bad weather, since nature is impartial and often unpredictable, and human estimates of good and bad don't count. We pray that not only sinners turn and be saved, but also for the rest of us who think we have no sin and are in greater need of penitence and healing. And finally, Lord, we pray not only for others, but also for ourselves, because salvation and righteousness begins in the household of God right here at Bethany. And we pray it in Jesus' name, him who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, follow along, and uh, if you're able, please stand for the reading of the scripture lesson this morning. The gospel comes from Luke 7, 41 through 52. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for festival of the Passover. And when his 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Assuming that he was in the group of sailors, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. After all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why are you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? The Word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Guess who? There's a story behind this. Back on December the 1st, uh, Pastor Allen was talking about John and John speaking to the people who gathered. Many, many people uh, from all villages. And it, the scripture reads like all the villages came out. Nobody was left in the village. Everybody was out to hear and see John the Baptist. Well, John, according to Pastor Allen, and he's right, said, you brood of vipers. That's what he said to the crowd. You brood of vipers. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't stick around too long if I was going to hear a message like that. I could do better someplace else. Except there was a hunger we don't talk about. A hunger for something deeper than just the regular mundane life of a fisherman or a housewife. Or there's, there's something that goes on inside the soul. Anyway, that's what Pastor Allen said. said it well. And then they talked about, and I haven't gotten over it. They talked about <clears throat> there ought to be a John the Baptist Christmas card. <clears throat> John is such a part of the coming of the Christ that there ought to be a Christmas card and there ought to be a, a song. And so the birthday boy and our wonderful pastor and John, they've got a, their work cut out for them. Because I'm counting on that song and that Christmas card for next year. You, we're we're going to have something very formal next year, right? <laughs> okay. Shall we pray for just a moment? Almighty God, would you reach down into the depths of our very being? Would you identify sins in our life? Would you forgive us as we repent? Would you revive our spirits and our lives? Would you do your work in us in such a way that we will never, ever be the same? It's in Jesus' strong and holy name we pray it. Amen. A couple words about myself which will help this morning because my right leg is already numb, so I may sit down for a moment. I was supposed to have had my back surgery by now. It hasn't happened, so it's coming on Valentine's Day. So, um, I am what you call a primitive Methodist. For those who don't know it, that means you've been a Methodist all your life, and you're probably past 70, but you remember when all the hymns had a caboose. Remind you of what we did back then? Amen. Um, came after every hymn. Uh, we've done a lot of things different, and we've uh, toned down the voices of our pastors, many of them. And we sing a slightly more acceptable uh, tune and message as we've gone along. I remember the days, and I'll bring them back to you just a little bit for a moment because we're with John this morning. Um, the mission of John, you'll find uh, Matthew 3, 2, and 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, You got a heart problem? Hold your breath. Repent! <laughs> Repent! For the kingdom of God is near. I don't think he said, Repent, please. <laughs> Before you go home today, would you just... Repent and, and promise you'll do better and, and here's some loaves of, and fish over here and, and uh, stay with us if you like my message. He said, repent! Now that's in Matthew 3. In Matthew 4, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, you get this. Chapter, two, uh, chapter 4, verse 2. And Jesus is talking and he says... And saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, I don't think, again, Jesus gave that as an invitation. Let's, let's go repent. 
we'll, we'll feel better for ourselves for it. Anyway, that's my primitive Methodist message for you this morning. And we'll get into a more acceptable style. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who has spoken uh, through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. In the very next chapter, repent. Jesus was walking outside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Got to get back to repent for a moment, because I know, like you, I'm perplexed once in a while about, okay, what did it mean to biblically repent? What a, don't throw that at me without telling me what it means. So repentance, metanoia, for the old language folk, called for throughout the Bible is a summons to a personal, absolute, and ultimate, unconditional surrender to God as for sovereign. God is sovereign above all people, all things. Though it includes sorrow and regret, it's more than that. In repenting, one makes a complete change, probably 180 degrees, from what they had been toward God. When you were a child, how many times did you beg your mom and dad to say, Oh, please give me another set of, lists, uh, of rules and regulations. I, I don't have enough to follow by. No. Right. I thought so. Never would they, a kid say that. I want more rules and regulations. But how often do they, at bedtime, at other times, but at bedtime say, Just one more story, please. Just one more story, please. You know what? There's such a compelling thing about telling your story or telling a story, reading it out of a book for kids, reading it in a classroom for kids. They love storytelling. What do we as family reunions and holiday celebrations do? We trot out the same old stories, you know, you know, Grandma Middleton, blah, 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 and you tell about Grandma Middleton and... Initiating each new generation in the stories of the ancestors. In their telling and retelling, we make them living history. They're not just dead facts. They're not just dead people. They're, there's a story there. And I love hearing other people's stories. There's always something to learn from them. Stories are how we learn who we are, where we come from, where we're going. A mature human being... A mature human being lives a well-storied life. There are stories that teach us about our identity as Americans. George Washington stories, covered wagon pioneer stories, North and South stories, Great Depression stories. And my grandpa was full of old Depression worries and, and stories. December the 7th, 1941 stories. I didn't live that style, but the hippie 60s stories, and some of the 70s maybe. 9-11 stories, Katrina stories, 93 flood stories of the Mississippi Basin. There's still other stories that teach us about our family identity. Some of our ancestors came through Ellis Island. Proud moment stories, scandalous secret stories. You got a skeleton in your closet? no matter how many generations ago. Celebration stories, triumph and tragedy stories, new love stories, I like to hear about them. Old grudge stories. Christians have stories. Christians are more than just our country stories. Christians are more than just family stories. Christians have the greatest story ever told. Thank you. We have a story of Adam and Eve. We have a story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We have a story of Jesus. The greatest story ever told. What is our most basic identity as Christians? We tell the story of Jesus to the world, those around us and beyond. But you know what? 
We each have a living story, our very own, because we've each come to Jesus or met Jesus somehow in different ways. I was on a bicycle carrying Globe Democrat newspapers in Mount Vernon, Illinois, about four in the morning. The dawn had not come yet. And all of a sudden, as a regular churchgoer, but I don't know why this hit when it did, the sky was light, my heart was warm, and I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, I am loved. God, Jesus, loves me. It was kind of immediate compared to most stories, I guess. It happened. The story of Jesus, I want to reaffirm what you've been told, but we already know. It's historic. Absolutely happened. We've got documentation on it. It was witnessed by many, many people for many, many years. Those who followed him martyred themselves. Now, you don't do that for something you just want to pass a story along about. Oh, there's a resolution for a new year, a new decade. We're at 2020. I want to ask you to share my 2020 vision. You can't say that very often, can you? But here we are, a new year, last Sunday of the old year. We're into a new decade, new year, and we can say it's 2020 vision or resolution. First comes Isaiah. Excuse me, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home, when you're away, when you lie down, when you arise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, after you know what you're talking about, after you've come to believe, know your story. If you don't know your story or what you would tell somebody who wants to know, what's this you believe in, this Jesus you're talking about? What does it mean to be a Christian? You have a story for them. It's not my story because I lived it a certain way. I came up a certain way. You have your story. But the resolution of all resolutions that can ever be given in a place in your heart is to stay forever laser beam focused on Jesus Christ. Now you can lead a regular life going about your business. You got a job, you got hobbies, you got this, you got that. But everything you do, you kind of focus on Jesus as you're doing it. The ultimate resolution that a Christian can make is to live in the light of God's intentions, not human inventions. God's intentions was for, the old primitive method is coming out, a man and a wife to be the definition of marriage. And I can go on and on and on. I won't do that because the denomination's in a struggle about that. And we don't want to go deeper with that. But, you know, he, God has certain intentions. He created things to be a certain way. And if they're not, then somebody goofed up. Because if you're away from what Scripture says, I think you are in the area of human inventions. Now I've got some good news and some bad news now. You like those stories, don't you? Good news, bad news stories. I've got a dandy. At least I like it. I've laughed many times on hearing it. It seems that this guy who went to the dentist regularly, he started with good care at his house. Uh, he brushed every morning, flossed irrigated with a water pick. Then he went to the hygienist, and after the hygienist was through with him, he went to the doctor or the dentist. And so 
it came to the final examination by the dentist, and when the dentist was finished with him on his last visit, he said, well, Simon, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. What, which would you like first? And Simon responded, I've always liked good news before bad. Seems like I can cope better that way. And the dentist said, well, okay, your teeth are perfect. Snow white, no cavity anywhere, no problems at all with those teeth. And then he paused. And Simon said, well, well Doc, what could probably be the bad news then? The dentist replied, well, Simon, your gums have got to go. Good news, bad news. There's, there's more good news. January the 1st is coming, 2020. Come down to breakfast Wednesday morning. Is that, is that Thursday or morning? Yeah, Wednesday. Come down to breakfast Wednesday morning and announce, I'm so hungry I feel like I haven't eaten for, since uh, last year. Uh, go jogging that morning and you've exercised every day in 2020 that you've lived. Get through lunch without eating potato chips and a candy bar. And this year reflects a whole new healthy, perfectly kept diet regime. So far, on January the 1st, perhaps you will have never cussed at somebody, never yelled at the kids, never forgotten to floss, never thrown your dirty clothes on the bathroom floor, and never forgotten to read the Bible in the morning. On January the 1st, your whole life can be transformed. For one day at least, all of your good intentions can get started and all of your bad habits can get discarded. At least for a few hours or minutes, the year is perfect and a perfect reflection of your very best self. Now, you ready for the bad news? The bad news is January the 2nd. <laughs> you know you where I'm going. January 1 is followed inevitably by January the 2nd and January the 3rd. Some, uh, someday soon you're going to opt for staying in a cozy bed for a few more minutes rather than plunging into the cold on that jog that you're supposed to be running. Pretty soon candy wrappers start appearing in your desk drawer again. By the 4th or 5th you're aggravated enough at a bad driver or a drop glass or a stub toe to have let out a blue streak loud enough to have the neighbors hear it. By the seventh, your socks are back on the bathroom floor and your dental floss is gathering dust. By the tenth, you fall asleep before you can even get the Bible open. For all but a few of us, most New Year's resolutions get packed away with the last of the Christmas decorations. By epiphany, our behavior and the whole new year just tarnished as they were before January the 1st. The problem with most of our resolutions is that they're too safe, too sensible, too self-centered. We like to live like this and beyond. We resolve to make tiny changes in our lifestyles but refuse to consider changing the paradigms by which we live. Luke's single story about the boy, Jesus, offers us an example of what it would mean if we were to transform our lives by making the ultimate resolution. The mother of all New Year's resolutions, the resolution that ends all resolutions, declare from this day forward we will be about our Father's business. Or put another way, we must keep our 2020 vision laser beam focused on Jesus Christ. I don't know where you are. <laughs> Joseph and Mary, their friends, neighbors, relatives, all made the required pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. But as soon as that allotted time was over, they wanted to get back home. They were anxious to get back to the regular hobbies, chores, responsibilities that filled their lives back home. Home is always more comfortable, isn't it, than being out on the road? Joseph was a craftsman after all, working with stone and wood, and undoubtedly had projects waiting for him, and... He needed to get back to that. Mary, housewife, would have a ton of things waiting for her to keep her family fed and clothed. 
Like most of us at the end of an extended vacation, we're probably looking forward to getting back the shortest possible route, the quickest way we can get there. But the young Jesus refuses to let his relationship with God be regulated according to some prearranged, culturally imposed schedule. Instead of going along with return to business as usual attitude, Jesus answered the most important call to be about his father's business. Now, we could take a sidebar right here and say, well, which father are we talking about? Joseph or God? <clears throat> I think we know. What would it mean if we were to act in a similar fashion? What would it mean to live not according to human expectations or culture patterns? What we find acceptable in this society we live in, but according to what God requires of us. I've got to say it again because it's itching at me. He didn't say, oh, please, would you please, please, please. God kind of tells you how it is if you just read the word. What, what would it mean to live not according to human expectations, our culture patterns? What does it mean to be about our Father's business rather than people's business or even other people's definition of God's business? Jesus discovered at a very early age that answering God's expectations can get you into trouble even with your own family. It did with Jesus. In fact, focusing on God's business may put an unexpected crimp in this family's business. Business as usual may not be the way God does business. And the world and the church find that a little unnerving at times. The ultimate New Year's resolution doesn't challenge us to cut fat grams or quit smoking or get to aerobics class twice a week. The ultimate resolution a Christian can make is to live in the light of God's intentions, not human inventions. The New Year's resolution, I've got to repeat it, to end all resolutions, stay laser beam focused on Jesus Christ. God's business. But this just begs a bigger question. What, what is God's business? God's business is transformation. Transformation comes after repentance. An electrical transformer takes high voltage and transforms it into energy that can, we can use in our everyday lives. Without a transformer, there could be no light in the darkness, no safety in the storm. At Bethlehem, God came to us and gave us Jesus the Christ, who transforms in his life the love and power of God into the impulses of grace that he gives, salvation that the world desperately needs. So what does the Christian who resolves to be a part of God's transforming work on January 1st do on Monday, no, Thursday, January the 2nd? There are two essential requirements. First, we've got to go deeply into the Word. We can't... We've got to study. There's homework. <laughs> Sorry, but it's a whole lot like school. When the young Jesus felt called to live beyond business as usual and answered the call to God's business, he first went to the temple. And I don't know why it took Mary and Joseph three days to find him there. Isn't that where he should, they gonna, should have gone first? But they looked all over town with relatives and their houses and so forth. They, it took three days to find him. Anyway, he was about his father's business in the temple. In other words, he steeped himself in the meanings and the messages of God's word. Knowing what God intends for men and women. Learning what God has already done and said and promised for this world. Is a necessary first step in the transformative process that we all need to go through. And second, we've got to go widely into the world being about God's business doesn't mean we do nothing but sit in the church all day long and discuss theology after a well-crafted sermon. Remember that while Jesus started out in the temple, he then obediently followed Joseph and Mary back into the world. We can't be a part of transforming the world unless we stand in its midst. We're a part of it. And that's the trouble with our traditional New Year's resolutions. They never step outside and the confines of our own self-centered existence. I want this, I want that. 
What if instead of resolving to lose 10 pounds each year, you resolve to eat a diet according to what would sustain the people of the world? Instead of resolving to get more exercise this year, you resolve in exercising more spiritual muscles and join a prayer group or a Bible study. What if instead of resolving to spend less time in front of a TV or more time reading good books, you resolve to teach those struggling with illiteracy to read those books to you? What if instead of resolving to spend more quality time with your family, which is wonderful, you resolve to take your whole family and team up together for a mission work in town or as far away as Honduras, Vietnam? Your life, your commitment to the ultimate resolution can help the love of God through Christ to transform this world. It is almost January the 1st. A fresh new year, a fresh new decade lies unblemished before us. We haven't messed it up yet because that ain't here. What do you resolve to do on January the 2nd for the rest of your life? Again, to our <clears throat> ultimate resolution, we must keep our 2020 vision laser beam focused on Jesus the Christ. It's required of us. Let us pray. Lord God, it seems like uh, these days and times we're challenged beyond anything that's ever been in history. People aren't afraid to speak up about things they don't have a clue about. They have an opinion about everything, and that's uh, Gary Moseman talking. But Lord, it is a tough world. It's muddy. Uh, it's uh, messy. We'd like to get that all sorted out and be closer to you. So guide our journey this new year coming up that we may walk a little closer to you. And if we've never met, had a real life experience with Jesus the Christ, may we somehow come to that and either speak to a pastor or a good Christian friend about what, what does it take? What, how do I get there? That that person will be ready with a, uh, their story to share with someone who's struggling. Lord, we pray this fervently in the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen.